This is your daily real estate syndication show, and I am your host, Whitney Sewell. Today is a highlight show that's packed with value from different guests around a specific topic. Don't forget to like and subscribe, but also go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can sign up to start investing in real estate today. I hope you enjoy the show. Our guest is Adam Carswell. Thanks for being on the show, Adam. Whitney, thank you for having me. A uh, huge honor for sure. And really excited to get talking. I'm honored to have you on. Pleasure to have you and, and looking forward to this conversation. Just getting to know you a little bit before the show. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And, and you have some special skills that anybody in the syndication business needs to know how to do. And I'm looking forward to this. A little about Adam. He's an entrepreneur and podcast host, new media marketing expert, investor relations specialist. He's director at Concordia Realty Corporation and business development manager at ASIM Capital. Combined, both firms have syndicated, redeveloped, repositioned, and revitalized more than $425 million worth of real estate throughout the United States. Well, Adam, you know, thank you again. Give the listeners a little more about, you know, who you are, your background, you know, a couple of things that we mentioned, I'd love for you to just share a little bit, and even where you're at right now. And let's dive in. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm coming to you, Whitney, and all of our listeners today live from St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, if you want to go ahead and Google it, you could take a look. St. John's is the first city in North America that the sun rises on every day. I moved here in May as a digital nomad and will continue my digital nomad journey to somewhere warmer once November <laughs> rolls around. So It's been a great experience here, originally from Cleveland, Ohio, went to Westminster College close to Pittsburgh, relocated to Belize to finish my studies and play and coach basketball there. Came back from Belize, moved to Washington, D.C., worked for a company there and then realized I wanted to get into real estate. Fast forward a few more years and now I'm sitting here talking to you, Whitney. So... I'm excited. Like I said, let's talk. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So you have a skill, you know, with the investors or, you know, bringing investors in and getting them on the the phone and your investor relations specialist. I know you shared a little bit about your team and some amazing things you all are up to and doing. And, you know, I know at least one of your your teammates pretty well or or gotten to know him a little bit. and, And I know, you know, just speak very highly of them, but let's elaborate on this process that you have of bringing investors in and getting them on the phone. Like it's so important, right? If we can't get an investor on the phone, you really don't have much, you know, cause you got to be able to build that relationship. And, you know, I get, I honestly, I get investment offerings all the time from people I've never met before, never talked to. And I'm like, well, how, how did you, how did you get my email? <laughs> you know, or, you know, this is not a pre-existing relationship. So, so, and, I, and a big goal of mine is, is getting investors on the phone, you know, and sometimes numerous times, you know, if we don't get to meet in person, I want to develop that relationship. I want to understand lots of things about them. But, but that first call is important. And, and I'd love for you to elaborate on, on how you get them there. Yeah. And I want to thank you for kind of bringing this question out of me because I don't think I've ever really taken a hard look at the science of it. It's um, in a way something that I think I've just always kind of done naturally. But when you look at it, you know, closing a deal, bringing, bringing someone's equity into the picture or just establishing that relationship. I think it does take a certain, maybe not even a necessary amount of skill, but an amount of awareness. Uh, one phrase that I like to, to use that I took from someone who's really good at marketing on LinkedIn, or, uh, actually Joe Applebaum, he always uses the phrase, you're going to be selling, you're going to be smelling. So in this world of business, in this world of life, really in building relationships, you have to kind of take a look at the idea of what can this individual do for me now versus what can this individual do for me for life? And I could say it's something that personally, I find a challenge that you have to work on every day. You kind of get stuck stuck sometimes thinking about now, 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 like closing this deal now. Well, the more you're able to make it a habit to think about, for example, you and I just kind of meeting for the first time right now, Whitney, you know, looking forward to the next 10 years of us knowing each other, 20 years or whatever, instead of looking forward to like, all right, this episode is going to go out on September 15th. Like, okay, bye. You know, some people actually do have that mindset and I can't speak for the level of success that they have. Maybe people are successful in doing business that way. I've just found that when you meet someone for the first time, when you're interacting with someone for the first time, if you have that idea of, can I sit down and have dinner with this person for the next 10 to 20 years? Because a lot of the times the deals that we're going into in this industry, you know, sometimes they last that long. I guess that's a a brief breakdown of the approach that you want to have in regards to getting someone on the phone and talking about a deal with them is always when you make that first impression, get ready to, uh, you know, at least anticipate a long-term relationship with the individual. I I could not agree more. And it's, it, it doesn't matter if I'm networking, you know, at a conference or if I'm, you know, talking to someone just like yourself, I try to allow enough time that 
just like you and I did talk, you know, before the show and even after some and, you know, even try to follow up and things like that, uh, you know, just to develop that relationship. Because like you said, you, you never know the value you're going to be able to add to this person or, or how they're going to be able to add it to you as well. And, and if you, if you just cut that off, I mean, it's, I don't know that I just feel like you get that sense sometimes kind of like doing the shotgun approach with business cards and a meeting, you know, uh, mm-hmm. running around. Well, you know, that person didn't make an impression at all. So can you talk a little bit about maybe your best way to get investors connected to you all and, and to get them on the phone? What do you all use to, to connect, make that first connection? And how do you do that? I think, what, again, what I found most successful is it's always best to, if you are going to maybe present a deal or talk about a deal to an investor to make sure that you actually have something in advance before even thinking about mentioning it. So if I'm at a networking event, for example, and I know that you know, for example, right now we have a, a workforce housing deal syndication at ASIM Capital. And so I can't think of any time that I just walked up to someone and say, hey, we have a deal. Like, you know, I, I talk to them, I get to know, actually, you know, you, you prioritize what their why is, you prioritize what they're interested in. And then just, in my opinion, you know, really just keep it ca- as casual as possible, obviously professional, but casual and just say something like, hey, you know, we've got this offering going on right now. Would you like to take a look at it? And I'd say more than nine times out of 10, 9.5 times out of 10, the individual, if you've built that rapport, if you take an interest in what gets them going first, they'll say, sure, you know, go ahead, send it over. And then from there, more questions will hopefully come. And once those questions come, you know, because I'm still relatively new to this industry to begin with, Hunter and Michael, who I work with, have a lot more experience. So I'll, I'll go ahead and say, you know, these are great questions. Would you mind hopping on a call with with Michael or Hunter. And uh, thankfully, those two guys have a lot of respect within the industry. So again, usually the individual's like, yes, please. Like, I want to talk to these guys. So I'd say that's really, you know, how my approach has worked. And I have no reason to, uh, I mean, I want to improve it, but yeah, changes. uh, I don't know which ones I'd make right now. It's going pretty well. Yeah, good, good. No, so, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, like in the bio, new media marketing expert. And I know you and I talked about like marketing tied to LinkedIn. And, and, you know, I'd love for you to elaborate on that. I know you mentioned uh, Joe Applebound. I think you mm-hmm, said, I, mm-hmm. I hadn't heard that name before. I wrote the quote down, you know, if you're, go- if you're going to be selling, you're going to be smelling. And, you know, elaborate a little bit about what that means as well. And just let's get into that, the LinkedIn marketing that you all are doing. Yeah. And this is uh, an interest that I'd say I've probably taken a little bit more personally and have been able to provide to grow our brand at Concordia, to grow our brand at, at ASIM. And then also grow, you know, my Adam, Carswell brand as well. First, I would say in re- reference to Joe Applebaum, guys, <laughs> go ahead and, and hop on LinkedIn right now. If you're in front of a computer or just make a note, go look him up on LinkedIn and connect with him. He's an expert, expert marketer. I'm sure he has somewhere between 20 to 30,000 connections. I know LinkedIn caps you once you get to 30,000, you have to start being picky, but just a, a very smart guy when it comes to doing this. And I've taken a lot of what I've learned from him and applied it to my own strategies on LinkedIn. Uh, one of which which I'm actually currently on a, on a 30 day hiatus right now. But um, again, I'll be back in action by the time this goes live is posting on LinkedIn every day, Sunday to Sunday. It sounds kind of hard. It sounds kind of crazy, but if you kind of develop a method to your madness, and even if it's maybe just like one sentence, for example, you're creating content. So what you're doing is you're kind of in a way forcing yourself to create daily. And the more you create, the more people are going to take notice of who you are and what you're doing. And one thing that I also like to share is it doesn't always have to be necessarily about business. People are gravitating more and more towards purchasing or doing business with someone who they can relate to their personality. And so sometimes I always like to use this as a reference. I I love going for runs. And so sometimes I'll just go for a run and I'll take a little like Snapchat video, like 10 seconds with the music I'm listening to going, which is usually like electronic or something kind of like, yeah, pump up music. Uh, I'll take it. I'll post it on LinkedIn and I'll just put something like, you know, treat your exercise like a business meeting. Like don't, don't miss a day. Stay, you know, stay on top of it. And then it'll be funny, like out of all the posts I make, something like that will get the most engagement. So that's a, that's a few examples there of how anyone listening can go ahead and improve their social media reach, especially on LinkedIn. I like that. Now, Snapchat is something that I have never like I've never even started an account on Snapchat. Is that something you recommend? <laughs> Snapchat is interesting. I would say it's definitely, well, I would not consider it a necessity for anyone growing their brand. I would say if you really just want to maximize every avenue that exists, you might as well get on Snapchat. But I think the three biggest players right now certainly are Facebook, which people are definitely taking notice to. Instagram, which if you want to reach out to people like me, I'm 28. So millennials, if, you, if you're looking to look for the future of your business, definitely get on Instagram. And then LinkedIn is just low hanging fruit, honestly, because I think there's over a half billion users right now. And like less than 1% of those half billion are posting every day. 
So if you want to stand out easily, again, like you know, LinkedIn is a great place to start. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, you said you, you make that video, you, it even records the song in the background that you're listening to. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if anyone here, you can, I think you can do it on Instagram too. I've just found it easier on using the Snapchat app. So if you're like, I listen to Spotify or whatever you use to listen to music, if you just let the music play and you pull up Snapchat, for example, and kind of press and record on the, or hold down the record button, it'll record you and then (laughs) the music that's playing as well. And then I just download it to my phone. And from there I can upload it to wherever else I want to post it. Okay. Now I didn't know how that worked. So I'm glad you you elaborate on that. (laughs) So LinkedIn, so you're posting every day and and I guess, tell me what kind of response would you say you get from LinkedIn versus Facebook or Instagram and, you know, for, for these investor connections? I think that LinkedIn is in my opinion, the place to start. I've noticed that slowly with the demographic of, I would say investors between the ages of 30 and 60, it's to me, it's really remarkable within the past year, Facebook has all of a sudden become another form of LinkedIn because people like the private groups and, and, and really that's, that's what's doing it is the groups. So I'm still basically, I would say learning on the best way to maximize Facebook, but I was trying to remember your question at the same time. I think it was uh, yeah, just LinkedIn. Those, those three platforms, where have you seen the, the best results? I guess we could say, you know, from different social media platforms, as far as connecting with, with investors for your all's team. Yeah. I would say personally speaking, I would go with LinkedIn again, due to the fact that how, if you're consistent, how easy it is to stand out and make an impact. I'd say about six months ago, I kind of set my mind to doing that daily posting, or at least as frequently as possible. And my network went from maybe just around a thousand connections to a little bit over 3000 right now. And it continues to grow daily. I'm the type of person that's really just going to accept anyone who wants to connect unless you legitimately give a, give me a reason to unfollow or whatever. So, and so that's what will start to happen. You'll notice a snowball effect and all of a sudden you're receiving more (laughs) requests to connect than you are sending out. And yeah, so because of that, I don't really know. I couldn't tell you why that's just seems to be what happens on LinkedIn. And and that's why I would recommend it from there. You can also say, Hey, what's your Facebook connect with someone that way. Our guest is Jason Urusi. Thanks for being on the show, Jason. Hey, Whitney. Good to be back. One topic today, Jason, that we wanted to talk about, I felt like, I mean, even just us talking about it beforehand, like you had this stuff just like memorized, you know, you were just laying these things out and it's talking to investors and really just, it's such a business, right? Just around that by itself and making sure investors are cared for and taken care of. And I'd love for you to elaborate on that. Let's, let's get into, you know, that, how you all are doing that, how you've been successful, uh, you know, in that process of, of really having investors ready and talking to them and marketing to them, all that. So we are really just laying the groundwork. And one of the awesome, amazing things about syndication or even just multifamily in general is you, is you have the opportunity to, to bring in investors so you both can benefit, benefit not only from, from the investment, but from the economy scale of being able to do a larger project together and ultimately reach whatever is your goal and your investor's goal at the same time, you know, whether it be generational wealth, cash flow, tax advantages, whatever would be the components. However, there's a number of steps that we, we partake in that, that have made this helpful for us. And we, we generally do this in, in a four stage process. And of course, lots of times when we go out and, and as being a salesperson or other point, it's always focused on the, on the close now. Well, that that ultimately when you're trying to create a relationship and really just trying to do something that benefit people for, for many years to come and having, having these investors that aren't only in your first deal, but your second deal and your third deal is just creating that environment where you, one, would be the first step understand exactly what they're looking for. Because not every investment I have is going to be a good opportunity for them. And they're going to appreciate when, when it's not. So if it's something that is, they're looking for a, a short-term project and they're looking for a quick turnaround in capital. Well, if we're having a project that may have a, a lifespan of five to seven years, ultimately we're probably not going to be the best fit for them now. Doesn't mean that we, we take them off our list, but we, we ultimately just want to make sure they're fluent for what kind of investments we're offering. When, when do you find something like that out? How do you know that? Sure. So it's based on the initial conversation, depending on, on where they come from, correct? So, so if it's family, friends, or, or immediate network, or if it's someone who has been, been uh, made, made a referral from somebody else or, or that. 
we'll set up if they're local, we may set up a meeting. If, if they're not local, we may set up a call. And we're going we're gonna to ask them specifically, what is the risk tolerance? What kind of investments uh, are they currently invested in? What, what kind of investments are they interested in investment in, investing in? Uh, what has been their investing experience in the past? What have been opportunities that they liked? What it would have been some of the success with those opportunities? So we can understand because investing in apartment building is generally a new concept for a lot of people. A lot of people don't know or did not know this was available to them or, they, or if they didn't know about it, they thought it was only available to larger institutional players. So when you're, you're bringing this to them, it's a, it's a brand new concept. So really the first step is just understanding what they're looking for. Are they, are, is it important to them for cash flow? Would they want the investments to be local? Would they, would they want the investments to have a, a certain timeline in there? Are they okay with the investment being solely in passive investor? Because all these are going to lead to us understand if this is going to be a working relationship where we could provide something of interest down the line. So generally we do that at stage one. The second part is now talking about multifamily investments in, in entirety. Explain to them what we're doing with this and why we're doing it. And it can go on two frames. If you have multifamily acquisitions that you've done in the past, then you could touch on those properties and touch on, on why, you, why you did them, what you liked about them, how they're going, how you're meeting performer numbers. And if you take in a property full cycle, the full results. If you haven't, that's fine. You could talk about the industry, the class. You could talk about why you like these typical type of investments. The, the, the number of the five factors, cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, debt pay down, tax advantages, how that forms out to be a great investment, how pooling resources from investors allows you all to benefit from the economies of scale to tackle these larger projects. If you have markets in mind, why you're talking specifically about those markets, if you're in a, a Dallas or you're in an Orlando or you're in, you're in a Greensboro or a Louisville, why you like those market dynamics and, and what you're looking to do to expand yourself that, to be, have full knowledge to take on such an investment. Do you have other board members in place that are, that are coming on that are going to be part of your deal that have experience? Have you put yourself through rigorous training of some capacity, some CCIM training or, or other? Then after that, that would be step two. The third step would be that this is potentially either you could use, if you've done a number of these, uh, show them a past deal and show them a representation of what the deal would be. But if you haven't done these, we, we created our, before our first deal happened, we created a mock deal. And the mock deal basically represented the kind of deal we were looking for and outlaid the type of returns we would be focused on how the whole period would work, how the uh, the structure would be laid out for the investors. And we went over the entire concept. So the investors were, were fluent with this. And that could happen over one or two conversations because generally when when someone's received with a lot of information, if they don't have time to, to take it all in and, and just conceptualize it, it the, the answer is always going to be no if you ask them if they like it because it's just too much to take on in one conversation. And then once we do that, we'll give them the idea about what we're looking to do and see if there's general interest Engage with their interest may be. Do they have an amount they, they potentially may invest? And what we find is that at that point, maybe it's not right for them at that time, but we'll keep them involved and let them know as we acquired a deal and keep them updated because just because they weren't ready at that time, they may be ready the second deal, the third down, deal down the line. However, if they are ready, they've now given us an, an idea of what kind of investment they, they are looking to make potentially. Maybe it's $50,000 or $100,000. And we'll slot that down and say, this is no confirmation of capital. This is nothing that that's guaranteed money, but this is now general interest that we've now created about telling them and asking them what they're looking for, telling them about what we're doing, what space we're operating in, and telling them about the potential opportunities that we're going to be looking for. So again, we, we don't have a deal yet. We're not even at that point of having that. But once you have a series of these conversations, you start really having an idea of how much capital may be ready for you for your investors, however, however you've made the connection, and you start to lay this out and start to build your groundwork with your investors, well, now it also makes you comfortable to the point where you can understand what, what type of product you can look for. So if you have the ability, you feel potentially to, say, raise $2 million, and generally a good landscape would be total price or total acquisition, you know, maybe a third could be needed just in, in capital raise. So then if you can raise potentially $2 million, then potentially you could look for a $6 million acquisition. So then it makes you have that warm feeling inside that you feel good that when you do go out there and now find a, a property and get it under contract, that now you have done the groundwork that you can go back to potential investors and now consider that you'll be able to have a successful raise. 
So once you actually find that deal, you're not going back to investors cold and you're not going back to the point of saying, trying to make them understand, you're, you're not trying to understand what they want. Then they're not trying to understand why you're doing this. And then they're not trying to understand what the whole multifamily deal looks like. And then now you're trying to pitch them on a deal. That's just too much. And it makes you look in need instead of really what the ultimate goal is. How can we help the investors meet what is going to be their goal expectations for their life and their future? And how can we work together? That is a much better scenario in how we like to operate. So we're now providing investments for, for people. They, we fully understand what may be the right investments for them. So when we do have the right investment, we can bring it to them. And it's already a conversation we laid weeks, months, potentially years before. And now it can be a very easy conversation because, hey, remember the kind of opportunities we, we had been speaking about in the past. Well, here is that opportunity. We have this great deal. We'd like it for these reasons, just in line. We're looking to hit these returns as we spoke about before. We're looking for this deal structure as we spoke before. Would you still be potentially interested? And at that point, it's a lot cleaner of a conversation, a lot more beneficial of a conversation for everyone going forward. Love it. Yeah, I appreciate the importance on laying the groundwork, just like you said, and, and that, that it's not like the second time this investor's ever heard from you when you're showing them a deal that's, or, you know, or, or we'll say a property that they could invest in. It's important that they know you, right? That they've mm -hmm. understood, they understand parts of the business and, and that you've somewhat educated them before uh, you have this opportunity. So, you know, through that process, you know, you mentioned like keeping them involved. Are there other, you know, how are you keeping them involved? How are you connecting with them, you know, on that ongoing basis? Let's say they don't invest on that first time, but you know, what are they seeing from you? How, how do they, how are you staying top of mind? Sure. So the easiest way is that if you have not put together a newsletter, a monthly newsletter and send them out updates, send, of course, you're going to be sending your investors out updates who are, are active in the project. You're going to be sending them out monthly, quarterly, however you set it up, updates about the property. However, you should be doing a monthly newsletter with those investors who may not have invested in this deal that are included, tell them what you're working on, how the deal is coming along, and just points about the deal that give them context about how you're tracking with what you actually said you were going to do. And ultimately, that's the best way to stay connected and stay in touch. So as the next opportunity comes up, they can still be top of mind with you when they do. And maybe it is the right time because investors don't always say no to you because of you or because of the deal. I mean, there's so many outside reasons. You know, it could be they get hit with taxes because they opened the, their own business, or it could be and they just lost their job. A number of different variety of reasons that, that have come up that are completely outside of you and the deal. So just because they say no, doesn't mean no forever. It just means no at this time. It's not the right thing. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.